Hello, everybody. I'm Tobias Miller, and I have the pleasure to be talking about our work uh, that we have been done at the University of Hamburg, which we have titled now, Block Me If You Can, Subverting Linux's IMA. So this, uh, this talk, this presentation, this work um, is about undermining or trying to undermine the security guarantees that you may be looking for when deploying certain security technologies. And in this case, the IMA, the Integrity, Integrity Measurement Architecture. And the very, very brief uh, gist of this work is that if you have, if you happen to have a manipulated block device, then, well, it may cheat on you and you may run afoul this, this bad device and it may actually uh, cause you to execute executable to binaries that you, well, didn't intend to run in first place. So keep in mind, this is academic work. The, well, uh, we have money, we have worked with a manipulated block device, which may or may not be common in your scenario. So the, the work is in the academic context, which means that we find problems where other people find solutions. We try to go, well, we, we wanted to see how far we need to go in order to break things that would typically, typically work, even if that means that we break assumptions that you'd normally have. We try to, well, uh, first break things and then tend to build these things uh, up again under maybe different assumptions. And as such, we thought that the IMA, the Integrity Measurement Architecture, was an interesting target because we've seen it in a few projects that we are involved with otherwise. So we work with people in the, uh, in the medical sector and in the, in the energy generating sector, like with power plants. And um, we've looked at how they use Linux and security technology. And then we've came across this, we've come across this, uh, the integrity measurement architecture. And we think it's, uh, it's very good technology and we've investigated how to actually, well, subvert the guarantees that people uh, are trying to get from, from IMA. And we've written this paper where you can see the, the screenshot uh, of this paper there in the bottom right. And uh, this work has been performed with my colleagues, which you can see there. And um, the context, very, very broadly, very general, is in the critical infrastructure domain. We focus on this area, well, because it's a bit more interesting for us, because it has a few challenges that other sectors do not necessarily have. It's very, we have the impression that this sector is written with legacy. So there's loads of, well, old machines, long lived machines that are say difficult to update and upgrade. And these, uh, well, these devices that are being run, they tend to have low memory, low computational power. And well, as such, they, they present an interesting target to us uh, academics. We have, uh, here a picture of a, a PLC, a programmable logic controller, is a Siemens device, which uh, interestingly enough has been uh, subject to an attack or of an attack with these uh, Iranian centrifuges. This was the infamous uh, Stuxnet attack. It was very sophisticated. At the end of the day, it involved uh, manipulated hardware. So somehow the victims, in this case, the, the Iranian centrifuges have been, uh, they have somehow received the malicious hardware, which then caused havoc and damage uh, and destruction to these, uh, to these devices. The, of course, Stuxnet was a very sophisticated and targeted attack. So the attacker in that case has had loads of, well, economic and, uh, and uh, economic power and was very knowledgeable in, in what they were doing. And um, you may not necessarily be subject to such an attack. So in that case, you may not necessarily need to worry about manipulated hardware uh, infecting you. In case of Stuxnet, however, it was uh, a simple pen drive, like your, your regular USB uh, key, right? The pen drive that you uh, tend to share with, uh, with friends. Such a device has been manipulated, the firmware, in fact, on, on one of these devices uh, to then uh, go undetected um, and, well, for Stuxnet, for the, the worm itself to, to spread uh, around the world, in fact. 
what it actually did was it caused the centrifuge to spin faster and uh, more slowly than uh, they were designed to or they were um, used for a normal use. And that caused them to wear out so super fast and then well, they eventually got destroyed. It has been reported that about 1,000 of those have been destroyed. Yeah, I would go as far as claiming that not, it's not necessarily about the damage there in this uh, facility, but there has been some collateral damage involved in, in running this attack. And you may very well be, well, cautious of this type of attack, regardless of whether you think that you're, uh, that, that another nation state will, will be your attacker. So there's other attack vectors as well. So it doesn't necessarily need to be uh, some governmental agency that attacks you. It could very well be the manufacturer, for example. You could get manipulated hardware from the manufacturer, like your hard disk, right? You could uh, uh, have bad firmware flashed on these devices before you even put your hands on them. And it doesn't actually need to be the manufacturer. It can, could also be that the device is being manipulated while it's in transit. And in fact, it has been documented that this happens. So there is an NSA program that, well, does exactly that. It uh, captures hardware while it is in transit and then uh, manipulates it and then forwards it to the, to the actual um, uh, recipient. And of course, then you have a uh, bug hardware and um, your computing, uh, well, the integrity of your computing cannot be maintained anymore. There's another interesting attack vector, uh, which is that an attacker, well, if you, if you have um, secondhand hardware, say, because you're in, you run an economic data center and you don't actually care with, about the latest and greatest hardware, you just want to run your, in this case, uh, controller for your machine, and you may even need a secondhand machine. In, and then the attacker may very well manipulate this, well, this first-hand machine before you buy it, and then when you buy it, it looks all great, but in fact, the attacker has infected you before you even got the machine. So the attacker managed to manipulate the machine while it wasn't actually yours yet. So some of these attacker models, they may or may not apply to you and some are more realistic than others. But we have luck the luxury of just assuming that this sort of attacker exists and then trying to figure out how this impacts us and how we could potentially defend against such, a, such an attacker. In the domain of critical infrastructures, you may uh, look for certain security guarantees. You may want, for example, to run only programs that you know are good. You may not want to run you know, this malware that you've just downloaded by accident. And you may also want to prevent malware if you ever run it, or if it ever gets under your machine, to persist. So you would want to, well, revert to something like a clean state or, or pristine state. And well, or if that's not possible, then you would like to detect at least that there's something uh, malicious going on, something that's not uh, how you thought it would be. Another interesting uh, goal uh, could be to convince someone else that you're good or clean or in a good enough state to, for example, be admitted to the network or that your patch state is, is good enough. You may um, want to run, well, protocols that allow a third party to be convinced that you're good. And some of these goals are realized through IMA or related technologies. One probably uh, a better known technology is, uh, is measured boot or uh, secure boot. Those two come, um, tend to come together. And what measured boot is about is to hash each step of the boot sequence. So when the machine powers up, first the firmware that's running on it is being hashed, and then the bootloader is being hashed, and then before the kernel is loaded, the kernel is being hashed. And all these hashes are stored in a tamper-proof, well, storage in, in some way that an attacker would have a really hard time uh, manipulating. Bear in mind, this is a very brief uh, description of these technologies that involves uh, much more, and especially the, the root of trust. This uh, can be very interesting depending on, on your scenario. But the, the gist of the measure boot concept is to hash each and every component uh, before it's being brought up and record that 
uh, that hash, this measurement as it's called, in a tamper-proof way. You can also compare those hashes against the golden value, against something that you know is good, and only proceed if, well, if it matches well enough. Those concepts can be extended onto the operating system. That is, each and every daemon that you run, each and every, uh, well, program that you execute or data that you load, you may want to know whether this, these things are good before you run or load them. Um, and integrity measurement, Linux's integrity measurement architecture allows you to, well, to extend those concepts onto, well, the operating system. So you can make Linux hash each binary that you execute before running it or that you would rather that you want to execute before actually running it. And uh, IMA also allows you to compare the obtained hash with your reference, with the reference that you have uh, saved somewhere. This, this IMA is, um, allows you then for going further even and doing what, uh, what is called remote attestation. So you can run sophisticated protocols um, that allow an attest for to verify that you are good, that you are only running software that has been approved and that you are now admitted to say the network or to resources that would be denied to you otherwise. It's um, noteworthy that IMA does not actually need a TPM. Like you can run the whole um, IMA without an actual TPM, it all uh, works locally as well. But of course, and you uh, don't have the, the root of trust, you don't have this, uh, the guarantee that the values are, are have been uh, stored in a tamper-proof way. It comes in handy for us because we can uh, run our experiments in virtual machines without, well, messing around with the TPMs or virtual TPMs. And just, we're just able to use the local logs. Uh, yeah. That makes things on our side a bit easier. IMA on a very high level um, looks like this. You have two modes of operation. One is the appraisal mode and the other is the measurement mode. And the appraisal mode is, well, is uh, similar in mind to secure boot. That is, you have, um, you hash each and everything and you, well, compare this, against um, known good values, which can be in, or which are stored in extended attributes. And you can not only have the hash values, but you can also have uh, signatures of, of those. And then you can, uh, well, use public key cryptography to verify those, those hashes rather than having static uh, symmetric values. The measure, I mean, measurement mode is uh, similar to measured boot in that each and everything is being hashed as it is. And you can have a policy as to what is hashed and what is not. And those measurements you can then challenge, like uh, an external party can challenge those, uh, those measurements and then you can get a proof of the machine being in a good enough state. One thing that we noticed is that the way it's currently done, and I would go as far as saying that the way it's, uh, it's thought mentally, uh, it's, there's an inherent race. So, if you read, if you read something off the disk, but you need to hash it before, then there's the potential for you needing to read it twice. Once for the hashing, and then once, uh, once again for the actual execution or reading of the file. This, however, tends to not happen in practice though, because there is the page cache, which well, not only accelerates things, but in this case, it uh, well, also makes things a bit more secure. At the end of the day, um, the whole thing should be memory already from the first read, and so you don't need to read a second time. But there may be circumstances where it actually happens that you need to read multiple times. And in this work, we concentrated on investigating the circumstances and the conditions and boundaries of uh, when this actually happens, how we can force uh, the second read of, well, the data that we want to read or execute. So the well, the attack, if you want to call it, or the problem uh, roughly looks like this. So we, we tell the kernel to, well, open or execute a file for us. And then before it does that, it wants to measure or hash the file. And then 
uh, IMA goes off and reads the file as it does for hashing it. And once it's finished and once everything is, is um, good enough, then the kernel comes again for actually executing or reading the file. And then the, the read request hits the disk a second time. So that's the inherent uh, time of check, time of use problem of this um, architecture, um, the way we see IMA being built currently. And we are, we are now trying to exploit this, this talk to problem here. So how do we uh, go about exploiting this uh, problem? We have uh, one big machine, which well is big enough for our purposes. And it actually runs um, multiple things um, for us in, in separate virtual machines. And so we created our IMA virtual machine. And um, in that machine, we then ran the, the IMA targets, the victims, the guests that we try to attack. This makes things a little bit more weird than, than they need to be. But well, we didn't really have other infrastructure back in the day when we performed these experiments. I think the results are not affected by the setup though. But uh, so you know, just to let you know that maybe the setup causes problems down the line with our, well, results, but um, I think it's, uh, it's solid enough. The, now having our basic infrastructure, we needed this uh, malicious block device. We've implemented this malicious block device through QMU the hypervisor of our choice. Um, we could have patched firmware directly, I suppose. I mean, if we worked on bare metal machines, um, but well, we don't have much experience patching hard or writing hard firmware in the first place, let alone patching it onto the, onto the devices. But uh, there are people out there who do this. So we know uh, that people exist who will manage to manipulate firmware of hard disks such that they well, act maliciously. So we claim it's not totally, uh, totally off the wall to, well, have malicious uh, hard disk firmware that somehow gets onto your devices. Our manipulated firmware has the goal of noticing the first request of our target binary, say, and then uh, notice subsequent reads assuming that then this comes from the operating system for actually executing it. So the first read, so the assumption of our target binary or executable is caused by IMA, so we assume. And the second read of our target binary is then caused by the operating, the underlying operating system actually wanting to execute the, the file. We have patched QEMU in, um, as of roughly last year, that was the, the latest release version that we obtained uh, when we start to, to implement this um, functionality, if you want to call it that. And it was relatively easy to patch QAMU such that, well, it has the desired properties. So there's this, uh, this file driver or this driver that uh, backs uh, block devices with, a, with an actual file. And in that, in that file there, in this, in this driver, we can uh, hijack the, the function that reads things off the of the file on the host. And well, the code is relatively simple. So this is the, the bulk of our logic. There's a bit of management um, piece, a bit of overhead, um, uh, well, on the top and on the bottom of this block. But this gives you an impression that this is, um, is not like much code that we need to uh, have there in order to have the desired properties. The main things it does is it counts the number of reads. So we, we have our target area that we need to define up front. And then we count the number of reads to that area of the, well, of the hard disk. And if we are in that area, we copy, uh, well, uh, OXFF in this case over to the, to the original value, assuming that the original value is, was something else. This obviously works for our case where we control everything. We uh, know what we have to expect in the B9 value. And now we know what to expect in the malicious value. So we, so we can easily discriminate those two. And it's obvious that these 
uh, well, these values would need to be adapted to an actual attack to, well, a real scenario. But, uh, well, it works well enough um, for our case because with this we can measure how many bytes we could successfully manipulate to our, met to our methods. Another um, challenge with our naive approach is that uh, depending on the file system, this method does not work reliably enough. So if you have sophisticated file systems, um, they tend to spread uh, the extends all over the, the disk and you need to sort of track them and you need to, uh, well, make sure that you don't overwrite the actual file system metadata rather than your actual, well, data that you want to manipulate. So, um, so if you wanted to, to do it correctly, then you'd need to account for actual file systems as well. That's not to say that we haven't used a, an actual file system, but uh, we have made it deliberately simple, uh, well, for us to not have to spend uh, too much time in things that are not directly in our interest. So now we have a manipulated uh, block device. So mm, let's check whether it actually works as, it's, as expected and turned out that it does. So we could manipulate the binary or uh, a binary that we have there on, on the victim machine, on the target machine. And we had a very simple, uh, well, a very simple executable that would uh, have some uh, tiny state embedded in, in it. And depending on that state, it would uh, either print a green screen or if, uh, if the state did not match what was expected, then it would print the red screen. And well, then in our case, we made it so that it should be greeted with the, with the recording um, well, uh, screen there. We used this also to check whether IMA was working as expected. And it turns out that, well, Ubuntu comes with, uh, with good defaults, but you still need to make it actually work. So you need to hash over like each and every file. You need to store the hashes in the, in the extended attributes and so on. Uh, we did all that and we manipulated our binary. And uh, then we saw that IMA was actually rejecting executing this binary because it was not matching uh, what it expected. Um, there is no screenshot now because it's actually boring. It just uh, prints something to the kernel log like IMA denied access or something. So <clears throat> we now know that our method generally works. Now we were interested in, well, how much can we actually manipulate and under what circumstances? How much memory pressure do we need to have and how um, how does that relate to the size of the executable that we need to have? So we have a, a, a small uh, program that tries to assess how many pages we can manipulate. And basically all it does is define an, define an array with all zeros. And the size of this array we can, uh, well, we can define upfront at compilation time and then we can all, as well decide where we want this array to go in which, which section of the ELF binary. And yeah, this is the, the definition of this, um, this array there. And because of the automation that we've, that we've used, um, we were able to change this size uh, upfront before we were compiling. That was, that was quite good. And this is the main logic of, the, of this test program. All it does is check whether the array is still zero or did the item in the array is still zero. And if it's not, then we have found a, a manipulation and we record uh, uh, where this manipulation uh, has been noticed. And then, uh, well, we go over the array. And we, at the end, we give the total number of manipulated bytes and the relation of well, uh, in relation to the total size of the, of the array so that we can have a neat value of how many percent we were able to manipulate. We use uh, system destructured logging, which is uh, very nice because it saves us a lot of headache when parsing, or now we don't have to parse uh, some output which could be interleaved and everything. This, um, so this is, uh, is very good. And then we have some so management around still. So while this is the main logic of the program, there's a little bit of logic still to create the memory pressure. And um, yeah, so this is not the whole binary, but you can all find it on, on GitHub. I'll present the link later. So as for the memory pressure, 
we have used uh, StressNG, which is a very nice tool with uh, many, many options. And the test program that we've seen just before, it waits for StressNG to be finished. And then in, in our experiments, we've run uh, one instance of a test for 50 times just to get some, some stability in the results and to see where things may be uh, less stable than we expected. And um, with this setup, we were we had all the necessary bits and pieces. Uh, we needed to glue it all together. We have a medium-sized batch script that well creates these virtual machines automatically, copies all the, the required scripts in, all the service definitions, and uh, sets up the IMA and, and all this. And we have um, tests for Remember, we have tests for two dimensions. The one is the size of the executable that we, well, are trying to attack. So uh, that we can change with, uh, uh, with the size of this array that we have there. The other dimension is the, uh, the pressure that we exert on the machine, the memory pressure. So with, uh, with the stress ng, we can fill in, uh, well, the number of, uh, of megabytes in this case, that it will allocate and, and will stress the machine with. And we run uh, our experiments in these two dimensions. As for our um, automation, we have made great use of, um, of great libraries that are out there like Guestfish, which helps us tremendously in, in getting files in and out of the machine for not only our services, but also then the logs out of the machine so that we can analyze them. We, uh, use the, the vert edit tool, which helps with greatly with uh, manipulating configuration files in place rather than just copying them over, which, uh, well, in our case is a bit more handy because then we could carry the state over and over. Um, uh, one thing we, we were a bit uh, fighting with is the, the offsets of the data that we are attacking. So remember, we have this executable and we have this array in this executable and the relatively simple task or the, the task that should be relatively simple of finding the, the actual offset of this array in the, in the executable turned out to involve more tools than I expected and more uh, grep and awk uh, than I thought was necessary to, uh, to finding this relatively simple address of, the, you know, of this array. You can have a look at all this um, at this GitHub link. It's not pretty, but it works well enough. It uh, produces these virtual machines, it runs them, it captures the output and the logs, and it uh, makes sure that all the uh, all the values are filled in for the various dimensions, and it uh, then produces a, a nice uh, text representation of the results. So this is all should be all fairly reproducible and fairly extensible for, well, if you think you could uh, run these experiments in another or better way. The results are, or one uh, slice of the results say uh, is this. So here we have a, uh, a fixed size binary and the, sorry, we have a, a fixed a memory pressure, 128 megabytes is uh, here what we exert on the machine. And we vary the, the size of the binary that we want to run, the executable. And as, as you could expect, if the, the executable is fairly small, like up to 64 megabytes, then we see little to no uh, effect of our manipulation. Everything will be in the page cache, only uh, occasionally uh, a few pages will be evicted due to the pressure exertion on the machine. But um, up until that uh, like 64 mark, 64 megabytes mark, things are normal, say no manipulation that we could observe. But if we increase the size of the executable, then 128 megabytes, and then of course, finally uh, 256 and bigger, then uh, we could manipulate more and more pages of this uh, of this executable. Uh, remember, we had uh, 512 megabytes of RAM, so this is not like a massive. Uh, uh, it's not massive amounts of, of memory. Um, 
I bet that uh, the results will be similar if taken into relation. If we had uh, two gigabytes of RAM of uh, memory, then uh, I guess we'd have to increase the sizes of the executables uh, accordingly, and I, I guess we'd have similar results. Um, this is to accommodate our critical infrastructure domain, where we know that the, the devices that are in use have, well, little memory. So this is um, this graph here shows uh, the fixed memory pressure of 128 megabytes. The, this graph shows a fixed sized executable, so 64 megabytes in this case, and we vary the the pressure uh, that we exert on the machine. You note that we have um, two lines. One is for manipulations in the text section, and the other is for manipulations in the data section. It's fairly similar. Um, one thing to note is that uh, Linux doesn't execute uh, ELF binaries when the data section is too big. We found that surprising. I guess there is a, a reason to that that we still uh, need to learn and find out why that is. It works with the text section, though. It's no problem, but the data section, uh, it doesn't, doesn't run the, the executable. All the results can be seen in this table is a bit big. It's um, not very, uh, the, details, uh, the details don't really matter here. Um, what you can see though is again, as you might expect, the top left of the half is all fairly zero. Like there's a fairly little manipulation going on. Of course, if the machine has 512 megabytes of RAM and I have a, an executable of uh, 32 megabytes in this case, and I only exert a pressure, memory pressure of one megabyte, then we'd be surprised to find uh, parts of our executable uh, to be evicted from the page cache. However, um, or not however, but also as expected in the bottom right, where we have um, huge executables and large memory pressure, high memory pressure, then nearly all the, all the contents uh, is gone from the page cache. So, the interesting uh, band, I guess, is there in the in the middle. Uh, there's sort of a sweet spot when the machines begin begin to thrash and to or to rather to evict uh, things from the cache, and where it then needs to hit the disk a second time for for reading the contents back in. Another uh, thing that's um, that may be interesting is that uh, some results tend to be quite unstable. So we have standard deviation of, uh, we have a relatively high standard deviation for some values, especially there in the 256 uh, megabytes executable and uh, there the, the 32 megabytes pressure. There we see a relatively high standard deviation of our values of the 50 measurements that we have uh, taken for this, for this particular run. Mm. We could run it another hundred times. Maybe it makes it better, but uh, it's like this one stands out because it's uh, yeah. We, we don't know. Maybe we just had a bad uh, bad timing there uh, when running the experiment. Another another uh, unstable result is uh, there in the in the top uh, with the 32 megabytes executable and uh, 192 megabytes of memory pressure. Also very unstable result. Maybe this is uh, this is where the sweet spot tends to begin, and maybe that's that's a magic value that, well, somehow creates more uncertainty in the results than what we thought it would be. Another interesting thing is that we noticed that the first thirteen and the last page were always retained in the cache. So you remember we had uh, recorded when we could observe the manipulation, at which byte in the array. And from that, we could infer that, uh, uh, as we say, the first starting pages we have uh, in, in all the experiments, we've always seen uh, being present. And so, uh, as well as the last page. Hmm, yeah, we don't know why that is. Uh, maybe someone has a clue. So that's, um, that describes the, the circumstances and conditions under which this inherent talk to race can be exploited to have a bad effect on the on the software that you run on your on your system that you try to protect with this uh, with this technology. 
So you may think, um, how can we, well, make the effects less severe? How can we mitigate uh, this problem? And we think that you'd somehow have to prevent IMA hitting the disk additionally. Like you somehow need to make sure that uh, this hashing of the of the file contents does not cause an additional read because once you hit the disk a second time, it can discriminate the second read and it can then cheat on you. You could probably mitigate that in turn by doing random reads, like if you're idle and then you just request random blocks, uh, hoping to sort of uh, trip up the, the modified firmware on the, on the hard disk. Another uh, approach would be to go more into, into the direction that uh, DM or FS Verity uh, are doing. So as far as uh, we could see, they, they verify each chunks rather than each file. So this is inherently more, uh, more granular, is more fine-grained in, in what it does. We were told that um, there have been patches on the way which sort of uh, adapts this uh, this style of checking for when pages are being or when uh, contents are being pa paged back in, uh, we haven't followed what exactly has happened there. So it may may be that IMA by now has a more granular approach to to verifying things. We also think that um, somehow making sure that you also include the the actual disk or disks that you're running or the firmware rather into the measurement process. Similar to what you do with the with the machine already, right? Like your your motherboard uh, is being hashed as well, like the firmware of that. But it's um it's a bit unclear how you would ensure that the the hard drive that you're having is actually running the firmware that it reports. Yeah, at least when you have general purpose computers, as we tend to have uh, still with specialized uh, machines, it, it may very well be possible. But at least uh, those that are being sold to consumers these days, we don't see how this could work. It may be possible. I'm clear to us how, how you do it though. So the things that we've discussed so far are, well, they have their, or they have their problems in the sense that uh, the hardware attacks by, by themselves are quite out of scope of IMA. So we are exploiting something that IMA does not actually try to protect against. Yet we argue that this type of attack exists and that the attackers exist that could execute or launch such an attack. But still, it's, it's a bit unfair of us to sort of, uh, well, exploit this while this is not something that has been actually tried to defend against. We also note that the binary sizes we have investigated, like uh, 300 uh, whatever megabytes, is not really something that you'd have. Although we also note that it's increasingly more common to have uh, large binaries. So I've just checked the Docker daemon has something around 100 megabytes. And uh, then I checked, uh, I have some, some Rust binaries locally, which are easily in the range of 200 megabytes. So I guess it's not, uh, at least for now, uh, it's not unreasonable to, to think of relatively large binaries. Although uh, your typical uh, Debian package is not that big. We also note that in order to execute such an attack, you need to have a very detailed knowledge. You need to be a very strong attacker to know like the environment that you're targeting and, and where the the binaries, like the data that you're attacking, is on the on the actual uh, hard disk. In that case, that requires a lot of uh, insight and motivation to well to launch this attack. But depending on who you are, you may very well be be a target uh, of such an attacker. What we'd also like to do, what we haven't done yet, though, is uh, to check other operating systems. So we were told that Windows has a very similar thing, but uh, none of us is a Windows person, so we, we actually don't know. And it would cost us a lot of time to actually check how to well do this IMA style of, of uh, integrity checking and verification 
in Windows. But we were told it's possible, so maybe one day we, we get around to actually do it. So to wrap up, we note that the attacks are possible indeed, but probably a bit unrealistic depending on, on who you are. With enough pressure on your system, with enough memory pressure, your, your Linux IMA system goes to hit the disk multiple times, at least twice. And this in turn can be used by, by a malicious block device to serve you malicious content on subsequent reads. In some cases, even a little pressure is enough, as we have seen. So there's, um, depending on, on the sweet spot range, um, there may be circumstances where, where you'd get surprised that your, your executable has been evicted from the, from the cache. But again, the attacker needs to be very skilled and very knowledgeable in, in your scenario. And um, it, it, it's more likely that you're not subject to such an attack than it is that you are indeed being affected. The, uh, this work has uh, resulted in, a, in an academic paper presented at this year's uh, ADAS conference. It's uh, the Conference for Availability, Reliable, Lead, Reliability and Security. And you can find the link there. And all the, the resources that we've used are there on this, on this, in this GitHub repository. The best scripts for creating the, uh, the virtual machines, the, the way for uh, extracting the results and, uh, well, um, uh, capturing all the, the, requ the required details. You find it all there. It should be reproducible. It's not pretty, but if you're determined, then, then you can get it to work and reproduce these results. If you have uh, any questions, then I'm, of course, available uh, after this talk, but as well, of course, uh, via email with this address there. And I would like to thank you for your attention and, of course, uh, thank my colleagues for this interesting work. And I hope you have uh, many interesting questions. Thank you very much.